Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us. We're just gonna wait a couple, couple more moments for folks to join um, and then we'll get going. All right, let us get moving forward. I know a, a few of you have joined already, so we'll get started. Um, so today we're gonna to share some information with you about getting started at CrossF. A lot of you are new members that have joined recently. Um, some of the topics that we receive the most questions from for our new members um, include some of the benefits and obligations, the roles of persistent identifiers or DOIs and metadata, uh, we're going to talk about the different methods to register your content um, and then how to update and add extra additional metadata to your to your deposits. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the common questions we get about invoicing and billing. Um, we'll also have a, a session for questions and answers um, at the end. So if you have a question, though, during the presentation, um, if you could write it in the Q&A box and not in the chat, it, it's easier for us to keep track of them and, and allows for others to see the questions. Um, though, if you'd like to say hello in the chat and tell us where you're from, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, the webinar is being recorded, um, and we'll share the recording in the slides by email within the next few days. So welcome, everyone. My name is Susan Collins. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Crossref, and I am uh, joined with my colleague, Isaac Farley, who is the Technical Support Manager at Crossref, and also Mike Nason, who is the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian at the University of New Brunswick Libraries, and also the Crossref Metadata Liaison from PKP. And he'll be talking about a number of OJS-related items today. So as a new member, uh, you and your colleagues will have received a number of emails from a membership team um, with a lot of information about starting on your membership journey. Um, and these include your, uh, your initial welcome email with your prefix, um, instructions for setting up your credentials, um, information on billing, um, voting process information will come out later this year. Um, and then there's also emails that you receive about reports and different, different ways to find support. So we're gonna be um, talking about a number of these topics on today's webinar. So being a member has both a number of benefits and obligations, and that's what we're gonna to start today by looking at both. So each of you um, and your organization had a reason for why you joined Crossref, um, but there might be benefits that you hadn't really considered or realized when you joined. So by registering your content with us, your organization becomes part of a globally connected network of scholarly research, and this grows each year. We currently have about uh, 20,000 member and affiliate organizations working with us, representing over 150 countries, um, and they've registered over 142 million content items with us. So being a member allows you to create a persistent identifier or DOI for each of your objects. Um, and with that, um, you're depositing the metadata for those items. And the metadata enhances the discoverability of your publications and makes your content more likely to be found. Additionally, the metadata provided by our members powers a variety of additional services that we've developed at Crossref, and these all benefit our members and the wider academic community. And then finally, members are able to vote for and stand in our uh, elections for our board of directors, and this gives members a voice in Crossref governance. However, being a member also means that there are obligations to your fellow members and to the wider scholarly community, and I've listed a few of those here. So joining Crossref is much more than just getting DOIs for your content. You're committing to a long-term relationship with your content and the metadata. And there are guidelines that members must follow, for example, for displaying the DOIs on their landing pages and your content. And members have an obligation to link out to their references for certain types of content. Um, and today we'll discuss how to meet uh, these obligations in today's webinar. So first up, we're gonna talk about metadata and DOIs and why both are really important. So metadata is at the heart of everything we do 
all of our services. There's a number of different types of content that you can that you can register with us. And most people know that DOIs are used for journal articles, but we accept all types of content that you see listed here. Um, and each type has a unique set of metadata and a unique format in our schema. So about three quarters of our content are journal articles, uh, followed by about 15% of books. Um, our newest content type is grants. And though while it's still small, it, it's uh, it's growing as more funders are now able to join as members and register their grants with us. Okay, so what is metadata? Well, metadata is data that provides information or describes other data. And again, metadata is at the heart of all of the services that Crosshair provides to the scholarly research community. So when you register your content, members supply us with a wide range of metadata, and that can include basic things like your titles and your authors, publication dates, ISSN, ISBN, again, anything that describes the content that you're registering. It also includes the DOI that you've created, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to create DOIs in a moment. So we also collect additional data um, about items, and these can include your reference lists, funding data, ORCIDs, ROARs, um, license data, um, information about uh, errata and retractions and updates can be registered through our Crossmark service. The metadata that's sent to us is going to vary based on the type of content that you're registering. However, we ask that you send us as much metadata as possible and that it be accurate and clean. So the more comprehensive your metadata is, the more likely your content is going to be discovered. However, this is only true if your metadata is accurate. So if you're not sure about something, you're better off waiting to send it to us. Records can always be updated. Um, at no additional cost. And we strongly encourage you to do that whenever you find more information that you can add to your records. But why is, why is registering comprehensive metadata so important? A lot of organizations and researchers use that metadata to find the content that you publish. And because process metadata is standardized and machine readable, it's very useful to a lot of organizations that use it to create tools and services that also make your content more discoverable. And these can include author profiling tools, manuscript tracking systems, library discovering services, metrics providers. You can see all of the different types listed on our metadata wheel, metadata user wheel. We receive millions of queries per month from both members and from the research community across all of our search interfaces. But regardless of what you're registering, it's really important to remember four things about your metadata that it's compatible, it's gonna be used downstream, so it needs to be well-structured and usable for both humans and machines. And that it's complete, so you should really include as much data as possible. For example, including all authors and not just the first author and including ORCIDs for the authors if they're available. Metadata must be credible, which means it has to be accurate. So no spelling mistakes or errors. If metadata is incorrect, it's really of no use to anyone and can affect the ease with which your content is discovered and the performance of various academic services. And then finally, that you curate your metadata records so that you think of it as sort of a, a living thing that you can keep enriching. You know, updating your metadata if there are changes, for example, if your URLs change, it's important to send us a new one so that your DOIs continue to work. And again, existing metadata can be updated at any time at no additional cost. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about DOIs, so what they are and what they aren't. Um, a lot of people associate Crosshack with DOIs, but it's important to understand that Crosshack is not solely about DOIs, that we're not defined by one particular service, but by how we support the academic community as a whole. And also, it's important to note that DOIs are not an indicator of the quality of a publication, or of the organization that registers it, nor is it a mark of quality of the research that's submitted. So DOI is a persistent link and an identifier for an item. So if you look at this, the, this screen, you can see this is the structure of a DOI. It's composed of three sections. So the red is the resolver address. So each DOI is an identifier, but also an actionable link, which means when you click on it, it resolves in a browser. And having that red part is what makes it actionable. The blue part is the, is the prefix, and that's assigned to each member when they join Crossref. And then the yellow part is the suffix, and that's the part of the DOI that's created by the publisher and is unique to each content item. So we'll look at prefixes and suffixes in a bit more detail. So when you join Crossref, you're assigned a unique prefix for your account. 
And it starts, it's in the format 10 followed by five digits. Now you might see journals that have a prefix with 10 followed by four digits. Originally they did, and then they've been up to uh, the five digits since uh, with Crossref since 2012. Some members have one publication, some have many. So one prefix can be used to register all of your content, even if you publish different types of content. So books and journals, for example, can share the same prefix. If you add a new title, you don't need to notify us prior to registering content for that title. Once you begin to register um, for that publication, the title is automatically added to your account. There's no limit to the number of DOIs you can create, and there's no minimum number required. Each member has a unique publishing schedule, so it could be weekly, monthly, even yearly. And DOIs can be registered at any time. We do receive a lot of questions from members about creating a suffix for their DOIs. Suffixes are best when they include short strings that are easily displayed and typed and that, the pre and that the suffix is opaque. And this is to say that the DOI itself doesn't need to have any meaning on its own. The suffix doesn't have to state anything about the item it's identifying. That's all done with the metadata that's registered with us. Um, for example, um, an ISBN or page number should be included in the metadata, not as part of the suffix. So while it might be tempting to use a pattern, such as a sequence, it can cause problems. Um, services and tools that use DOIs might try to predict future DOIs that aren't registered. If you must use a suffix with a meaning, something like an internal system identifier can work, but it has to be managed carefully. Our best advice is that your DOI suffixes should be consistent, simple, and short. So don't include anything in the suffix that could change in the future, as your DOI is meant to be around forever. Um, when creating the suffix, you can use the letters A through Z, keeping in mind that suffixes are case insensitive, uh, the numbers zero through nine, and then certain characters like hyphens or parentheses. Next, we're going to talk about how DOIs should be displayed. First, they shouldn't be posted on your content or your websites until they have been successfully registered and the DOI is active. So when listing your DOIs, we do have guidelines for displaying them properly. And it's really important for consistency and usability that all members follow these guidelines. One of the most important is displaying the DOI as a URL, and this makes it actionable. Um, guidelines also make it easy for users to cut and paste or click and share a DOI. For example, you know, click, yeah, using right-click to copy a URL. And then using the full URL gets users to recognize that a Crossref DOI is both a persistent link as well as a persistent identifier. And it also enables machines to recognize Crossref DOIs as URLs. So once you've registered your DOI, it's important to display it on the landing page, keeping the previously mentioned guidelines in mind. So a landing page is the resolution URL that you provided when you registered your content. In other words, this is the place that the reader will be taken to when they click on your DOI. So the landing page itself needs to contain a full bibliographic citation so that the readers know they've right, arrived um, in the right place, that they've got the article that they've been looking for. Um, it also needs to have the DOI displayed as the URL, as I mentioned in the guidelines. There also needs to be a way to access the full text of the article. Now, access to full text is controlled by the publisher. It could be a login or a subscription, but the landing page has to, has to let somebody know how they can go about doing that. The landing page also must be accessible to everyone. So for open access content, a DOI can resolve to uh, the HTML full text of the content if this page includes the criteria that I've mentioned. A separate landing page would not be necessary. You can see here on the screen an example of a landing page, which contains the full DOI, the author's title, and a way to download the article. Okay, now my colleagues, Isaac and Mike, are going to talk about the different ways to register content. Um, let's see. Here we go. Is this you, Isaac, or I can do this? Okay, I'll pick up here. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Um, so CrossFit members uh, register their content with us and they include more than just the DOI and the research resolution URL. So there's a lot of, uh, of other content, of other metadata that you can include. Um, 
Members can choose their register, to register the content with us by sending us XML files directly. If they aren't able to do that, we do have some helper tools available. And these helper tools provide an online form where you can type in information about the articles um, and it turns them into XML behind the scenes. Our web deposit form is one example of a helper tool. And for members who register their content on OJS from PKP, there's a Crossref plugin to help you add your metadata and then register it with Crossref. Um, and Mike is going to talk next about how one does that with OJS. Yeah, great. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you, Susan. Uh, so yeah, again, I'm Mike Nathan, uh, and I'm a librarian by day, um, but I am the Crossref and Metadata Liaison for the Public Knowledge Project who make OJS. They also make Open Monograph Press, and they also make Open Preprint Systems. All of these software platforms have Crossref integration in one way or another, uh, but today we're going to talk about uh, OJS. Um, because so many organizations use OJS, uh, a bunch of years ago, Crossref and PKP sort of started this collaboration to create like a less technical method for OJS users who used to be pretty limited in their ability to submit to Crossref. Uh, so they can just leverage the API and push content directly to Crossref, which is really nice. Um, it's a great way to sort of help publishers and journals take advantage of Crossref services, and PKP is also a Crossref sponsor. Um, we started with an export, export plugin uh, that sent metadata generally straight to Crossref, uh, but it's important to know that OJS utilizes two plugins, and I put an asterisk because there's more than two plugins, but two, like if you're just, there's two plugins that matter uh, the most. Uh, one plugin assigns DOIs to publications within the system, and something has to be assigned a DOI before you can then register that DOI with Crossref. And the other plugin registers those DOIs with Crossref. So we'll keep those two functions in mind. There's a DOI plugin, which assigns DOIs to works, and there's the Crossref export plugin, which registers those DOIs and related metadata with Crossref. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about enabling these plugins, turning them on in OJS, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you configure and use them in OJS. So to enable plugins, uh, this is pretty much universal in OJS, but for this plugin specifically, under settings on the left-hand side, you click on website, you can click on plugins, and then scroll down under uh, installed plugins, scroll down under the section labeled public identifier plugins. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there you'll see the DOI plugin. Uh, clicking the box to the right of the plugin description will enable it. And once it's enabled, you'll be able to click a little arrow. There's one sort of just to the left of the word DOI there. Uh, OJS uses these a lot to sort of expand and collapse menus. Then you click that button to expand the menu. Uh, and then you'll see the button to click on settings to configure o uh, DOIs in OJS. Next slide, please. Uh, so when you configure your DOI plugin, what's important to note is that these aren't necessarily cross-ref settings. These are DOI settings. Uh, these are a little bit uh, individualized at this point. <clears throat> and so the number one thing you need to do is choose the content uh, for which articles you'd like to have DOIs assigned. Uh, we recommend articles only. Uh, you can select articles and issues. Uh, I wouldn't recommend clicking all three. Galleys is not necessarily as useful to Crossref as it may be to other uh, registration services. Uh, and then below that, you need to enter the prefix as assigned by Crossref. So when you receive your membership welcome email, you'll know what your prefix is. And this is where you put your Crossref prefix. Next slide, please. Uh, after that, you get to choose your DOI suffix. So Susan talked about this a little bit before. You have a lot of different options in OJS. Um, one is to just set up default patterns for issues, articles, and galleys. Um, I would recommend just using default patterns as often as possible and not being too bothered about what a suffix looks like in the end. Um, DOIs do not need to be human readable. Uh, people have a real temptation to make them uh, represent specific information or act as shorthand. Uh, but they absolutely don't need to do that. They're really just strings of characters. Um, if you need to in enter individual DOI suffixes for each item, like if you have a special way that you want to do it or you're populating back issues, you can select the second option to enter an individual DOI suffix for each published item. And then below that is the ability to configure unique custom DOI patterns uh, for your suffixes below. Uh, and again, you know, try, try not to make things too complicated. Um, you can review the Crossref recommendations for DOI suffixes before creating custom suffix patterns. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so enabling the OJS Crossref plugin. This is a little bit easier. I believe it is automatically enabled in most cases, but we'll just go through the steps here. The same under settings, you click website and plugins, and then you scroll down under installed plugins, uh, and you find the section labeled import export plugins. 
Next slide, please. Uh, there you'll see, just like we did with DOIs, we'll see the cross effects on the Lexport plugin. Uh, and if you see the box grayed out but checked, that means you're good. You don't need to worry about it. If it is unchecked, check it. Uh, and uh, then your plugin's ready to go. Next slide. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so then you have to configure your Crossref plugin. Uh, and the Crossref plugin uh, can sometimes be a little confusing for people. There's two sections here. There's depositor information, and then there's your credential. So at the top, you can fill out your depositor name and email. This doesn't have to be the name of the person who signed up for Crossref or any of those things necessarily. It's just the person who's going to receive technical information or deposit information. Uh, if there's a problem with the deposit, that's where error emails will go. Uh, and it's attached to the deposit itself. Um, so you can enter your depositor name and email here. And then below that, you fill out your username and password. Uh, these are your Crossref credentials. And they're provided to you by Crossref with your membership confirmation. Uh, so don't put your OJS credentials in here. Just put your Crossref credentials in here. And it's important to note, uh, a lot of people copy and paste into OJS from the email. And one thing they tend to do is they put a white space on either side of that password accidentally. And then what they see is a 401 error on deposit. They go to deposit their work and they get a big 401 error. If you see that error, it means your credentials are probably not put in properly. Um, so you can go back and review and just make sure that the username and password are entered correctly. Next slide, please. Uh, OJS can also be configured to register your DOIs automatically on publication. I recommend you do this uh, if you are not particularly picky about how your DOIs look. Um, you can check this box on the plugin settings to turn on automatic deposit. And the way this works is as soon as an article or issue is published and the status flips over, it'll automatically assign the article uh, a DOI and then it'll add it to the queue and then it will automatically register that DOI with Crossref. Um, there's another setting on this page you will see, depending on the version of OJS you were using, uh, that will mention using the Crossref test API. Uh, unless you are very, very sure that you have a testing account with Crossref, do not check that box. Some people just kind of check off all the boxes, assuming that they want all the options. Um, but if you check this and you don't have that configured the way you mean to have it configured, uh, uh, it, it, it will be bad and your uh, plugin won't work at all. Uh, and when you're done, click the Save button at the bottom, and you can move on. And now your Crossref plugin is configured. Next slide, please. So uh, depositing is actually very straightforward uh, in the Crossref plugin. You can check on the deposits by clicking the Articles tab within the plugin. There's only two. There's Settings and Articles. And the plugin will report the registration or deposit status of DOIs per article. So you can see in the screenshot I included here, some of these haven't yet been deposited. Uh, and one of these is active. And we know that these are active because we sent them to Crossref and we received status back from the Crossref API, letting us know what the status of these articles are. Uh, if you want to manually deposit or update metadata, you can check a box and then you scroll to the bottom and there's a little deposit button and you can manually deposit works that way if you would rather manually deposit them. Again, I recommend uh, automatic deposit and it's worthwhile to come back every now and then and check just to make sure that your DOIs are going uh, in the Crossref the way you intended. If there's an error, you'll see a failed option. You can click it and see what the error message is. And then you can email Isaac and say, help. <laughs> so this isn't, things are bad. Um, and it's also worth noting, this is how you update DOIs. Uh, and we can talk, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But if your metadata changes for a publication in OJS and you've already registered your DOIs, you'll have to hop back in here and redeposit your work to make sure that that metadata is updated uh, with Crossref and its registry. And I'll note too, uh, and I forgot to mention this before, but in the bottom of all these slides, there's links to the documentation that PKP hosts um, for any of these specific things. So you can follow along uh, if you need to. Next slide, please. Um, there are a handful of other additional Crossref related plugins in OJS. There's uh, a reference linking and deposit plugin, which we'll talk about uh, a bit later today. Um, you can include funding data. That's another plugin that's optional, um, which will include like grant information and granting organizations, granting bodies, grant IDs, that kind of stuff. Uh, and there's support for similarity check and the authenticate service, uh, assuming you have access to um, the back end or administrative support uh, for your OJS install. There's information on all that stuff there. And as always, you can contact PKP folks at our support forum for more help if you need it. Uh, and with that, I think I will hand things over to Isaac. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Susan. I'm going to talk about the web deposit form. So uh, yeah, next slide there, Susan. 
Um, not all members who generate their own XML, not all, not of all, not all of our members generate their own XML or use OJS, and that's fine. We have other options available. Um, we have a manual entry form, or we call it a helper tool called the web deposit form. It's here on the screen, as you can see. Um, this form is very basic. It allows you to enter data into a field. You go field by field, and the form writes and then submits the XML to us for processing. Um, you don't need to know XML to use the form. You just need to be able to type the information straight into the form, uh, and we'll create the XML for, for you. Um, the form is limited in what uh, metadata it collects, so it's not as thorough as a full XML deposit, but it is simpler and less, techni less technical. It has all of the most commonly used uh, and required fields. Um, so you can use the web deposit form to register journals, books, conference proceedings, reports, dissertations, uh, your Crossmark policy page, if you're using Crossmark, and also supplemental metadata. Um, there are some, as I said, it doesn't support all metadata elements. So uh, you you can't currently register all, all of your uh, metadata using the web deposit form. Um, however, you can add uh, many of these to an existing deposit later on using other tools. Um, and you know, some examples of that are funding and license information, similarity check URLs, uh, text and mining, uh, text and data mining URLs, um, they can all be added, but not in the initial deposit using the web deposit form. So those th that list of things that I just mentioned would, would have to go through a supplemental metadata upload. And then references, which is a big uh, element, obviously can't be added using the web deposit form, but we do have a tool called the simple text query form, which Susan will talk about here shortly, um, which can be used for registering references. Yeah, next slide. Thanks. Um, so the first step in using the web deposit form is to check the type of content you are registering, um, whether that's journal, book, conference proceedings, et cetera. Uh, and once you choose that type, uh, different metadata fields will appear depending on your, your, your choice. So we're going to go through uh, a journal example. So this is the second step. So you want to add the content that you want to register. Um, you can deposit DOIs for each article within a given issue. And let me emphasize now that if you are copying and pasting into the web deposit form, and Mike gave a similar warning about OJS, this one is uh, specific to the web deposit form, but if you are copying and pasting your metadata, I highly recommend using a plain text editor. Uh, many of our members will use a rich text editor like Microsoft Word, and that will introduce formatting that comes from the rich text editor, which can create issues when you're using the web deposit form. So a simple plain text editor is recommended for uh, if you are copying and pasting your metadata into the web deposit form. Um, you can register one or more articles uh, for each issue in any deposit. So if you want to register one article, that's fine. If you want to register many uh, articles within that issue, that's also fine to use the web deposit form. Um, on the first screen, you'll enter the information for the relevant journal or issue, and then you'll click add articles. And then on the second page, uh, you could see in the top left there, I this, this screenshot includes uh, the information that I that I entered on the previous page. So it's actually building the XML in real time. So after you've added information for each article, you can click on add another article at the bottom to register the next article. When you're done, you can click finish. Um, the last step will then be to log into your Crossref account credentials and add your email address for the person who should receive the submission log email. Even if your login username is your email address, you will still need to add an email address to receive the submission log email. It can be the same or different email used as your login username. F finally, once you've entered that email address, click deposit. Your submission is then added to our submission queue. Um, we process that asynchronously. Um, so there is a bit of a lag there. So you, once you submit it, uh, depending on how many other submissions we're working through at that time, um, yours will be processed in order. And then once we processed your file, we'll send you an email to the address that you gave us in that previous step with the results of your submission. 
And we ask you to review that log to make sure your content was registered successfully. We also send you a copy of the XML that was generated using the web deposit form. And that XML is, is just for your records. You can keep it if there's any problem with that with your registration, that XML can be helpful for you or can be helpful if you need to contact our support team in troubleshooting that problem. Um, please note when you first register your first item, be really careful about the journal title you enter or the book title or the conference title, whatever that may be. Um, we, have a, uh, we have a rigid title check process in our uh, admin tool. Uh, so consistency in your met metadata is really important. Um, if your journal title uh, was first registered as journal A, and then you came back and, and tried to register it as journal B, even a slight change will create submission errors. So you really want to make sure that you're consistent and you get it right the first time. Um, the metadata that our members register with us is stored as XML. So it's XML, whether you're completing the web deposit form, whether you're completing OJS, whether you're submitting XML to us directly. And our schema, uh, our XML schema provides a structure and a set of rules to keep everything consistent and interoperable. A schema is a set of rules defining what can be included in, in what format. And so we have a single uh, deposit schema, which supports a range of different content types. Um, for certain type of uh, updates, we also offer the resource only section of the schema. It's kind of like a, a lightweight stripped down version uh, that can allow targeted updates of content um, like license information or relationships. And um, for those of you who are planning to create and send us your own XML, the samples here linked on this slide are really an excellent way to kind of get started uh, and just get acquainted with XML. It's a, it's always the place I go to whenever I'm working on, with XML is having a nice sample. So uh, there's a list of samples and they include a range of, of content types. Uh, on this screen here, we have an example of an XML file. So you saw back on the on the web deposit form a couple slides ago that we were building the XML. Here's here's XML right here on the screen as well. On the left is the XML, and on the right is the information being sent to us that was created in the XML. The initial XML you create for the content registration must include metadata and identifiers. The elements need to appear in a defined order. And in this example, you see a basic uh, journal article and it contains journal metadata, the title, ISSN. It includes issue and volume information. Um, and the metadata collected for content types will differ uh, but you'll be able to supply a title, contributor, publication date for all of them. And then um, every XML file that you send to us has some member specific information in it, including the email address element. Um, and I talked about this in the web deposit form. Um, this email address element is where we send the results of your submission. So it's really important um, that if you're going to if you're going to review your submission logs via email, um, that you put in an email address that that where you'd like to receive those submissions, and you can you can uh, get the results of your submissions there. So, I think pass it back to Susan to talk about reference linking. Okay, thank you, Isaac. Um, so, going back to what I mentioned earlier about there's a number of obligations to being a member, and so one of those I'm going to talk about in more detail now, and that is reference linking. So what is reference linking? Well, it's it means that including Crossref DOIs displayed as URLs when you create your citation list. And what does this do? Well, reference linking makes it possible for readers to follow a DOI link from the reference list of a published work to the location of the content on a member's publishing platform. And that the DOI might resolve to, to the full text article or to a landing page that we like we talked about earlier. And so this enables researchers to follow a link from your list to the current location of a work that is being cited. And this is an example on the screen of a reference with the DOI included in the reference. So reference linking is an obligation for all Crossref members for all current journal content. And that means content published during this and the previous two years. Um, it's encouraged for back files, which is content published prior to that. And also it's encouraged for other content types, such as books and conference proceedings. Um, the best practice is for new members to start reference linking within 18 months of joining as a member. Um, it's always and always to make sure that your DOI links 
um, in your references conform to our DOI display guidelines, meaning that they're displayed as a URL or clickable link. So how do you get started with this? Well, first you have to determine if any of your references have been assigned across our DOI. And there's a couple of ways to go about doing this. And we have some lookup tools we've developed. Um, OJS also has a plugin um, to enable reference linking, uh, reference deposit and linking. So reference linking can be accomplished by a number of different teams, depending on a member's workflow. And this could be your production team or your editors, service providers. And you can also ask authors to include them um, with their submissions. So we're gonna look at our tool, which is a simple text query and also the OJS plugin. So the, our simple text query tool allows you to match reference lists to any DOI in the Crossref system and then you can also deposit them into your article metadata. So the first step is to simply uh, copy and paste your reference list into the text box and click submit. And then it will bring you back the list of references and any matching DOIs. And then you can add them to your reference lists. So uh, not all references are going to have DOIs. And if there isn't one for a piece of work in your reference list, there's no obligation to link anything to it. Um, you can also use a form to deposit your references. So this might come in handy if you've registered your content with our web deposit form that Isaac just mentioned, which doesn't have the ability to take reference metadata. So to do this, once you have the result of your query, you can select the deposit button, at the bottom of the form. It's going to have you complete a couple of fields, which are your email address, the parent DUI for the item, and then your account credentials. Um, and you can use this form, even if you've registered your content with OJS, as long as the content has a DOI. Um, so as we mentioned, OJS also has a plugin to do this. Um, if you're using 3.1.2 or, or later, there are, there's a plugin available, um, and there are two steps you need to follow to include references in the initial deposit or to add them later. So first, you have to enable references as, sub, as a submission metadata field, from your workflow settings. And you can see, um, you see the pathway here on the slide. Um, and then the second is to enable the Crossref reference linking plugin located in the plugin gallery. Um, the process will automatically add the extracted article references to the DOI registration with Crossref. And then Crossref will automatically check and display any DOIs that are found in the submitted references. Um, users can then check the reference se section of the metadata to see what reference DOIs have been linked. Um, if the article references change once they've been registered, the article DOI with the new references will have to be updated. Um, and then you can check for found references. Again, the DOI work uh, should be, the DOI should be checked again for that. Um, so next up, I'm gonna pass back to Isaac and he's gonna talk a little bit about updating and adding extra metadata. So juggling to answering questions and presenting. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Susan. Um, as mentioned, maintaining your meta metadata is an obligation. Um, so we're going to go through that and talk talk about uh, some examples here. Um, so once you start depositing metadata with us, maintaining it is, is key to keeping it clean, complete, and up to date. Um, so so Keeping your metadata clean that can uh, can include identifying and correcting errors like spellings, spelling mistakes, or typos. Uh, you want to make sure that your metadata is complete. So, adding additional metadata to a record should that become available. Um, things like ORCID IDs, ROAR IDs, grant information. Um, these things are uh, becoming more more and more common in uh, in metadata uh, records. So, um, adding that over time is helpful. And then. Uh, keeping your metadata up to date, for instance, if your content moves platforms, you may want to update your resolution URLs um, from the previous platform, and we we can accommodate that. There's, there's never any charge uh, for updating your metadata. So it is important that readers can always find and use the content that is published. Incorrect or outdated metadata will not help uh, researchers find your content, and, and errors may result in missed citations and all-around confusion for for people in the community. So it's important to keep it up to date. Um, here are some common examples of metadata maintenance. We love rich metadata uh, and so do individual users and the systems that they're using. Um, but the quality of the metadata is more important than that the quantity of that metadata. If for example, you aren't sure what a metadata element is and that metadata element is optional, 
do not include it, just omit it. Instead, seek clarity on that metadata element using our documentation or ask in the community forum at community.crossref.org. We're always happy to answer questions and um, the community of users there is always happy to, to shed light there. Um, I've also included a link here um, about what is what metadata elements are required, recommended, and optional. Um, that's also a good place to take a look um, if you're seeking clarity. Um, and then you know, one, one other point to make is things don't always go as expected. I work in technical support. I know this all too well. I do deal with this day in and day out. Humans and the systems we've created make mistakes. Uh, and metadata er errors are bound to happen on occasion, even for the most careful of users. It's okay. We're here to help. We'll get you through it. Um, some of the most common metadata errors that my team sees are um, authors who are contacting us to say that their names are incorrect or incomplete. Um, if content has moved over time, which it will do, um, URLs need to be updated and um, users within the community notice that and flag that to us as well. Um, publication dates not included in the metadata is also something that is, is a common problem. And then I talked about this earlier, but we, we see a lot of title mismatch problems. Uh, and I'll re reiterate this here. We have a very rigid title check process in our system. So even small changes in journal, book, and conference title level uh, conference level titles can result in submission errors. So it's really it's it's really important to be careful about that. For instance, if you're if you have a journal with the with the word and in the title, and you you know at one one point use an ampersand, and then you come back and type out the word and that will that in itself will create submission errors. So it needs to be exactly the same. We try to enforce consistency um, with those checks. Uh, and then just the final point here, um, incorrect metadata hinders discoverability, reusability, credibility, and generally isn't good for anyone. So we want to make sure that um, we avoid those when we can. And then correcting your metadata to correct or update metadata that for a content item has already been registered with us. There's a, there's a few things you can do. Um, and within OJS, Susan talked about this, but you can find uh, the record you wish to update um, and add in your new metadata and update it and deposit it again through the cross Crossref import export plugin. Um, you must be running at least OJS 3.1.2 uh, and have the Crossref import export plugin enabled for that. If you're using uh, the web deposit form, um, you can also make updates to metadata there. You just would re-enter your record um, with the with the metadata that's that's correct. So we will overwrite the metadata that was pr previously deposited for uh, for the DOI or DOIs in questions. So, for example, if you find that you've misspelled an author's last name, you have to manually type it in uh, or copy and paste that information in uh, to correct the last name. Uh, and then you can resubmit the the article's metadata in their entirety. Um, and then for XML, you can redeposit an XML file with the updated metadata in it directly to us. Uh, when making an update, you must supply all of the bibliographic metadata for the record being updated, not just the fields that need to be changed. Um, and during the update process, as I said, we overwrite the existing metadata with the new information you submit. Um, and we never charge for those updates. Um, I've had, there's been a couple of questions in the Q&A about updating resolution URLs. Um, we do have a process to update those in bulk. Um, so you can just update uh, URLs them, themselves uh, for content. Uh, and please remember that a new, new DOI should never be assigned uh, for, uh, for a DOI, for, for content uh, during a title transfer. Um, that's that's the last bit there for me. Okay. Oops. Thanks, Isaac. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about some some of the common questions we get um, about invoicing and payments. So let's just spend a, a quick moment on those. So for most members, there's two sets of fees associated with process membership, the annual fee, which covers your membership, and the content registration fees, which are a one-off fee for each item that you register with us. Um, and these will vary by content type and by publication date. 
Um, so our membership invoice is sent out um, in January, the beginning of the year, to cover the forthcoming year. And the content registration invoices are sent out quarterly, um, the beginning of January, April, July, and October. So the deposit invoice is going to include a lot of information, including the number of items registered for each prefix. Some members have more than one prefix, so it's helpful to know what, is, what belongs with what prefix. Um, it will also list the month that the content was registered. And if the, if the content is current year, you'll see CY or backfile BY on, on the invoice. Um, again, current year means that content is content that was been published during this and the previous two years, and then backfile is the content published prior to that. One thing to note is that you may not receive a content registration invoice every single quarter. If the content you registered in a quarter totals less than 100 US dollars, we'll roll that amount to the next quarter. And this is to avoid members having to pay lots of small invoices, um, which uh, may incur some charges, especially for um, if you pay by wire wire transfer fee, uh, wire, by bank transfer. Um, if you haven't reached um, 100 US dollars in fees by the last quarter of the year, we'll send an invoice for whatever the balance is at that time. So it would be, it could be less than $100 then. So this means if you've only registered a small number of DOIs in your first year, you, you may not receive an invoice until, um, until the end of the year in your quarter four invoice, which is sent out in January. Um, payments can be made um, with credit card through our payment portal, by wire transfer, and by check. So I just want to wrap up by thanking all of you for joining us today. We hope that you found the information valuable um, as you get started on your Crossref member journey. Um, so the value of Crossref comes from our members and from the metadata that they register. Um, and this creates a, a rich and reusable open network that is used by the global community. I'm going to leave some links here for a moment. If you need further help or information, you can refer to our support documentation. The link is here. Um, if you have a specific technical question, you can always email Isaac and his team, um, support at crossref.org, and they will be they will get back to you. And we do encourage you to check out our community forum um, where you can post questions um, to the group. Um, our support team does monitor that, but also members of the community can also help with questions. And then PKP has a support form as well and documentation for using OJS. Um, as I mentioned, we are gonna send out the recording and the slides um, later on uh, within a couple of days, but we do have some time now for um, additional questions and answers. Um, if anybody has some, we are happy to, to take those for, for the remaining few minutes of the hour. Hey, Susan, I see uh, a question uh, in Q&A that I'm just going to answer live. Uh, oh, it uh, uh, looks like someone already typed in an answer. It was about um, having multiple prefixes for multiple journals. We have we have members who have one prefix and use it for thousands of journals. So um, th th that's not a requirement, you know, having your own prefix for your for each journal is, is not something that's required. Um, and and we'd prefer that you just use the same prefix for all of your content. I don't see anything else in Q and A, and I'm trying to stay on top of chat. I don't see anything in chat either. Okay. Uh, it's a question about payments. Um, do payments automatically appear in invoice platform? Well, if you, our billing department can give you a login to our payment portal, and you will see. Um, invoices available there. We do email them out, but you can go into 
um, you can log into the payment portal and see what open invoices you have there. Um, again, I think there's a question here about um, generating um, DOIs using letters and numbers. So with a suffix of a DOI, um, you can use uh, a combination of letters and numbers, um, letter, the letters case insensitive, whether it's you know lowercase or capital, letter zero through nine, and then um, a couple of different uh, characters, a hyphen and parentheses um, can also be used. Okay. Any other questions for folks for us today? Great. Great. If that is it for questions, um, we will wrap up and we will uh, we will get the information out to you soon about the with the slides and the recording. So um, thank you all for joining us, Mike Isaac. Thank you so much for um, for joining and um, helping out our members. So it was, I hope everyone found it valuable, and um, we look forward to hearing from you. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>